our Wednesday night Bible study. Oh, Alan uh, said that his hill was still pretty slick and he couldn't get out. So all the students in his class just stay out front here tonight. I don't think we have any. <laughs> So, all right, ladies' Bible class, or ladies' Bible study, will be February 1st here at the church, 6 p.m. on that. Uh, children's Homes truck will be here February the 1st. Items needed are on the bulletin board. And then if you want to teach the next quarter, uh, just see Alan, and he can get you lined up with that. Some updates on our sick. I talked to Ron a while ago, and he said Marilyn is still hurting pretty bad. He said she had a doctor's appointment today, but they didn't didn't make that, so we'll have to get that rescheduled. Uh, update on Jana Robinson's uh, that's Mel's uh, daughter-in-law. Uh, they were going to do a biopsy on her kidney but they have determined they're just going to go ahead and remove the kidney here sometime soon. So I need to remember her in your prayers. And Ms. Shirley said that Bob Season Good had his back surgery today, uh, did well, and everything looks good. So that's what the doctors have said. Those are the updates. Anything else need to be mentioned? Join me in prayer. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, for this time we have to gather with our brothers and sisters, this midweek service. Thank you, Father, for us being able to be here. It's a good time to be uplifted, to be with our family. We ask you, Father, to be with those that we mentioned that are sick, those expecting surgery, and those that have had surgery. We ask you, Father, to be with the families of those who had members that pass away recently, the uh, Hewlett family and uh, Joanne family. We pray, Father, that they can look to you for their strength. And I ask you to bless them. Father, for the sick, we ask you to continue to be with them. Pray, Father, that the doctors can do the things most needed for them to alleviate their pain. We ask you, Father, to look after them. We pray, Father, that they return to their health. We pray, Father, as we go on through this week that we can be a shining light for you. This is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Good evening. Good evening. If you have your hymnal, turn to 216. 216. Sing one, two, and four this morning. He leadeth me, O blessed thought, O worth with heavenly comfort brought. Whate'er I do, whate'er I be, still tis God's hand that leadeth me. Yeah. 
Sometimes mid scenes of deep is gloom. Sometimes where Eden's bowers bloom. What water still or troubled sea? Still tis this hand that leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me. By his own hand he leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. And when my task on earth is done, when by thy grace the victory's won, in death's cold wave I will not flee, since God through Jordan leadeth me. song will be number um, 772. 772. Good evening. Good evening. If I mention to you um, Romans 8 or Galatians 5, what might come to your mind is the Holy Spirit. Rome, you remember in Romans chapter 8, that wonderful uh, chapter that talks about how the Holy Spirit helps us uh, when we pray, uh, Galatians 5, the fruit uh, of the Spirit. But both of those chapters include a, a verse, eight four, uh, Romans 8, 14 and Galatians 5, 18, that make this one phrase, led by the Spirit, or led by the Spirit of God. In Romans, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. And that's what I want. I want to be led by the Holy Spirit. And I can do that when I read my Bible. Okay. In Acts chapter 2, Peter had told me, told them, to repent. Let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So that's pretty good news because now if I come to a level of faith and I believe what the Bible teaches and I repent and I confess Jesus before others, I'm baptized into Christ, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, it seems then that I can be legitimately hopeful of being led by the Holy Spirit, right? That makes, uh, makes sense. And that's got to be uh, great news. Um, my life should become a lot easier then, right? I'm going to be led by the Holy Spirit, so everything ought to be easy. I, sh I should be led to better decisions, uh, better opportunities, a comfortable Christian life. Because I don't have to lead myself. I just let the Holy Spirit lead me, right? Or is the song, He leadeth me. But then I found the phrase, led by the Spirit, in another section of the Bible in Luke chapter 3. When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven, one of my favorite little passages here, you are my beloved son, in you I am well pleased. And then what happened? He was led by the Spirit, right? To an easy life, right? To great joy and happiness, right? As you begin chapter 4, Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days 
by the devil. Well, that's a bit of a downer, isn't it? I thought led by the Spirit would be this easy, awesome, take care of all my problems situation, and it wasn't even easy for Jesus. And that turned out to be a challenge that he accepted and uh, was victorious in. So it appears that a Christian life led by the Spirit has no guarantee of ease or worldly pleasure. But it is an abundant life of love for God and love for our fellow man. Don't think of your life after baptism as easy, but don't think of it as anything other than a joyful life. So let's get to work, okay? If you have anything uh, that you'd like to share with your brethren this evening, uh, something on your heart, and you want us to pray with you, please come up here. I'll be standing soon. Why do you wait, dear brother? Oh, why do you tarry so long? Your Savior is waiting to give you a place in his sanctified throne. Why not? Why not? Why not come to him now? Why not? Why not? Why not come to him now? What do you hope, dear brother, to gain by a further no one to save you but Jesus. There's no other way but his way. Why not? Why not? Why not come to him now? Why not? Why not? Why not come to him now? Why do you wait, dear brother? The harvest is passing away. Your Savior is longing to bless you. There's danger and death and delay. Why not? Why not? Why not come to Him now? Why not? Why not? Why not, why not come to Him now? Now dismiss your classes. Y'all are quiet. I must have been outside playing in the snow all day. Good evening, good evening. Good evening to those who are online. I'm a little crooked there. So we've got about 20 devices on with us, so that's good to see. If you have your Bibles, we're going to first look at a passage in Leviticus 13. Um, Jerry couldn't be here tonight. Um, I think he was out of town for something. And uh, so I'm going to continue on with the miracles of Jesus. I corresponded with them, make sure that the one that I was covering was not the one that he had already covered or was planning to cover. Uh, it's going to be in Luke 17, and we'll look at that in just a second. But we're going to start here in Leviticus 13 and 14, and we're going to begin talking about leprosy. The miracle of Jesus we're going to look at is the healing of the ten lepers in Luke 17. And so it's good, I think, first of all, to start with what is leprosy, how did it affect people, and how did it change their lives? So when you think of leprosy, what do you often think of? Skin disease. Okay, skin disease. Sometimes working out. 
Something breaking out. Okay. Turning white. Okay, we see some evidence of that in the scriptures, right? Uh, Moses putting in his hand in his cloak, pulling it out. Um, yeah, uh, Miriam turning leprous there. Um, I guess Aaron did too. It also had the effect of gangrene. You have lost tissue. Okay, there's a, a losing of tissue in some types of leprosy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the modern day leprosy. Is, I think it's more in line with that. It's called um, Hansen's disease. And it's the idea that you lose the ability to feel pain. And so people could be like mopping on the floor and they're doing it too hard and they, they really hurt their hands. Um, and so that's usually what we think of, of leprosy. And, and that certainly is a type of leprosy when it comes to the Bible. But it's not the full picture of it. Um, there's a, kind of a broader sense of what leprosy is in the scriptures and it most of it has to do with just certain types of skin diseases so it, it's kind of a broad term I've, I found a few um, terms that I probably am going to butcher saying uh, it could be lupus ringworm favus and there's one more that boy forosias um, psoriasis. psoriasis wow I was way off. Psoriasis. Okay, so like psoriasis of the liver. I've never seen it spelled, so there you That's Okay, never mind. Just listen to Grant, don't listen to me, okay? Um, but there's, there's certain uh, things, and, and you can actually read through if you uh, have the stomach to read through Leviticus uh, 13 and 14, where it talks about the different things, whether it would be the hair that's infected or the boils and all that stuff. Uh, if you like doing that stuff, um, which I know there's some people that do. I, I don't see Bev here. I guess she's teaching, but I know she likes all that gross stuff. But uh, not, not for me at all. Um, but here in Leviticus 13, starting in verse 45, we see kind of the, the uh, consequences of having these skin diseases uh, under the old law. It says there in verses 45 and 46, The leprous person who has the disease shall wear torn clothes, let, their, let the hair of his head hang loose, and he shall cover his upper lip and cry out, Unclean, unclean! He shall remain unclean as long as he has a disease. He is unclean. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside of the camp. Imagine what that would do to you if you one day woke up and you saw something going on with your skin. It's kind of the same way that we're feeling right now, I think, with COVID, right? You have a little bit of a cough, and you're like, oh, no, <laughs> here we go, you know, <laughs> or something along those lines. Um, uh, and we have to kind of quarantine, so there's some isolation there, but the isolation for them was much longer in many cases. Imagine having to move away from your family just to prevent them from getting it, too. Imagine all the, the social consequences that would go into that. Uh, even the religious consequences. Uh, they weren't able to appear before the altar. They weren't able to, um, you know, in later times when there were synagogues, they weren't able to meet uh, with those who were gathering on the Sabbath day to worship God. Um, they, they can go to the supermarket and get food. And um, I'm not real sure. I haven't, I, I never, I didn't read this week about anything uh, like who served these people, who brought them food, because they would have had to have some type of sustenance. But, um, but it certainly was not a life that any one of us would choose at all. And so um, this was, for many, they felt like this was like a life sentence, uh, to be exiled from uh, the life that they knew. However, there are, were provisions in the next chapter, Leviticus 14, of what happens if you were to somehow get rid of that disease, if that disease were to pass from you. We see uh, in verses 1 through 20 what would happen. Uh, let's just start reading a few, uh, a little bit of that. Um, there's certainly a lot of details that we don't necessarily need to cover tonight. But here in verse 2, this shall be the law of the leprous person for the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought to the priest, and the priest shall go out of the camp, um, go out of the camp, and the priest shall look. Then, if the case of leprous disease is healed to the leprous person, the priest shall command them to take for him 
who is to be cleansed two live clean birds in cedar wood and scarlet yarn and hyssop. And the priest shall command them to kill one of the birds in the earthware vessel over fresh water. He shall take the live bird with the cedar wood and the scarlet yarn and the hyssop and dip them and the live bird on the blood of the bird that was killed over the uh, fresh water. And he shall sprinkle it seven times on him who is to be cleansed of the leprous disease. He shall pronounce him clean and shall let, let the living uh, bird go into the open fields. And he who is to be cleansed shall wash his clothes, shave off his hair, all his hair, bathe himself in, in water, and he shall be clean. And after that he, he may come into the camp but live outside his tent seven days. On the seventh day he shall shave off all his hair from his head, his beard, and his eyebrows. He shall shave off his hair, and he shall wash his clothes and bathe his body into uh, the water, and he shall be clean. And then uh, after that, chapter, uh, verse 10 and following talks about the sacrifices that he's supposed to make on the eighth day. So it was a little bit of a process, but in our day and time we kind of understand why there was a process that... If he had come back too early, it very well could infect other people and spread the disease to other people. That certainly isn't something that you would wish on your worst enemy. So that, that's a little bit of the background of, of these uh, leprous people and what they had to go through and really the way out. If, if somehow they were healed from their disease, this is what they had to do, the steps they had to take in order to be brought back into their community and... Um, be able to go about their lives like uh, they used to. All right, now flip all the way over to Luke 17, and we're going to read about some uh, lepers. Luke 17, starting in verse 11. On the way to Jerusalem, he, meaning Jesus, was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. All right, so... Galilee's up here at the top, Samaria's in the middle, and Judea, where Jerusalem is, is, in the, is the bottom. And so he's up there towards the top, kind of near his homeland, uh, near Nazareth, right? And verse 12, and as he entered a village, he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance. Well, why did they stay at a distance? They had leprosy, right? They were unclean. They... They were trying to be, I think, respectful to Jesus, right? Um, they weren't supposed to be close to him at all. And so uh, they stood a distance. It says they lifted up their voices, saying, verse 13, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. All right. We, we're not given the details how they knew about Jesus and how they knew about his healing ministry. But it was clear to them that Jesus had the ability to have mercy on them in their situation and to give them some type of healing uh, for their, their disease. And so verse 14 says, When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. All right, Remember back to Leviticus 14. They had to go show themselves to the priests to kind of get cleared, right, to be able to go back into their community. But Jesus said this, and were they healed yet? Not healed yet. So what's Jesus asking these lepers to do? Have faith that they would be healed, for one thing. Yeah, to have faith that they would be healed. That by the time they got there to the priest, they would be able to show themselves to the priest. And so there is... Uh, for all ten of them, it seems like they all had faith. Because the next uh, line says, next sentence, And as they went, they were cleansed. Can you imagine a, a people that had been ostracized for so, so long, uh, tormented by this um, horrible disease, and then, just like that, as they were on their way to have all their spots, all of their blemishes uh, taken away, can imagine how amazing that would be. But they had faith, and they were rewarded with, with physical cleansing here. Look at verse 15. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, 
praising God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. So we have ten of them going to the priest, and only one returns. And what's that person doing, that leopard is doing? I guess we could say former leopard at this point. What was he doing when he returned to Jesus? He was giving thanks, right? He's praising God for what God had done. Obviously, only God could have healed them like this in this amazing way. He fell uh, on his face at his feet. Think about that for a second. You know, uh, we find a lot of different postures of, of prayer and worship in the Bible. Um, but often, I don't know if we really get in those postures very often. Um, and we certainly see a kneeling. Uh, we see a bowing a lot of times when it comes to worship. Um, and so maybe that's something must for us to think about as we praise and worship God. Um, the humility of getting down as low as you can. And here, he's near his feet. Is that a pleasant thing? <laughs> right, just like, mm -mm. nope, nope. Yeah, if someone were to bow next to my feet, that would have been bad enough. But think about the first century. They wore sandals. They walked everywhere. Imagine the filth and the stench of their feet. That's why washing feet was so important at that time, is because they, their feet were really nasty. And here he came and he fell at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. So he was, he was grateful now we have this little uh, addition to here uh, that Luke records for us, um, which is uh, an interesting thing for Jesus to bring up here. After he sent these ten to go see the priests, only one came back. It says about the one who came back, now he was a Samaritan. Who were the Samaritans? They were a mixed race from the Israelites. Okay, a mixed race from, from the, the Israelites. Tribes. From the, the 12 from the tribes? Ten tribes? From the 10 Okay, so the northern 10 tribes, Israel, uh, the northern kingdom of Israel. You had the southern kingdom of Judah. It had two tribes, right? And so this was the mixed race. It was kind of the, the offspring of those tribes and, and foreign peoples. Uh, if you want to just mark there in um, Luke uh, 17, I want to go back and look at uh, 2 Kings chapter 17. 2 Kings chapter 17. It gives us a little bit of a background on uh, who these uh, Samaritans were. Now, obviously, this is, you know, this is a reflection likely right before the exile or right after the exile uh, that was written here in, in uh, 2 Kings. Most think that Kings was before the exile and Chronicles was written after the exile. Well, and all appeared in a captivity and they left a bunch of them in Worthless ones behind. We're about to read that. So, um, and so, but this was this was about four hundred years, at least four hundred, probably closer to five hundred years, uh, maybe five hundred eighty years uh, before Jesus came. So, some things changed a little bit about the Samaritans, uh, and we'll talk about that. But Second Kings chapter seventeen, uh, starting in verse twenty-four, says the king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, Cuthath, Ava, Hamath, and uh, Sarah Vine, okay, and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the people of Israel. So Assyria was the one that came and conquered Israel. In fact, they even conquered many fortified cities in uh, Judah at that time, but they were unable to penetrate Jerusalem. If you remember uh, Hezekiah and how he prayed to God, and God uh, essentially took out, I think, 180,000 of um, the soldiers there that were coming from, um, from Assyria. So the Assyrians come through, they destroy Israel, and here we're seeing this, um, not a deportation, but an importation of all these foreign people into uh, this land of Samaria, this northern 
area of Palestine. Verse 25, And at the beginning of their dwelling there, they did not fear the Lord. Therefore the Lord sent lions among them, which killed some of them. How cool is that, right? <laughs> so lions were uh, the means of God's just uh, judgment and justice on uh, the people who didn't worship him in that, in that land. Verse 26, and So the king of Assyria was told, The nations that you have carried away and placed in the cities of Samaria do not know the law of the God of the land. Therefore, he has sent lions among them, and behold, they are killing them, because they do not know the law of the God of the land. Then... The king of Assyria commanded, Send there one of the priests whom you carried away from there, and let them go and dwell there, and teach them the law of the God of the land. So one of the priests whom they had carried away from Samaria, so this would have been a, a former Israelite, uh, I guess he'd still be an Israelite, but he used to live in the northern tribe of Israel. He came from uh, Samaria, excuse me, he came and lived in Bethel, and uh, taught them how they should fear the Lord. But every nation still made gods of its own and put them in the shrines of the high places that the Samaritans had made, every nation in the cities in which they lived. The men of Babylon made Succoth, Benoth, the men of Cuth made Nagral. Man, this is hard. Let's just move on down. Uh, they made a bunch of gods, okay? Verse 32, And they feared the Lord and appointed from among themselves all sorts of people as priests of the high places who sacrificed for them in the shrines of the high places. So they feared the Lord, but also served their own gods after the manner of the nations from among whom they had been carried away. All right, so here we see a religious pluralism there in Samaria. And... Uh, they tried to send someone from exile, from Samaria, to go and teach them. And they did teach them to worship Jehovah, Yahweh, the God of Israel. But um, they had all these other gods as well. And so the, um, by the time of Jesus, all right, so uh, we're thinking 700 years later, um, after that point, we'd seen that the people of Samaria that, that stayed there, the, the Israelites, had intermingled and married these people who had been uh, imported in, and they were viewed by the, the Jewish people as uh, as a mixed race. They did not accept them as um, as brothers or sisters. Uh, they viewed them as foreigners. We actually will see that in uh, this passage. Jesus even speaks about him, them as being foreigners. Uh, a little bit later, after exile, in the book of Ezra, if you want to turn there real quick, in the book of Ezra, Ezra chapter 4, uh, remember the first part of Ezra is about uh, them coming back in the land and start building the temple, uh, rebuilding the temple. And there in Ezra 4, it says, Now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the returned exiles were building a temple to the Lord, the God of Israel, they approached Zerubbabel. And the heads of fathers of father's house and said to them, Let us build with you, for we worship your God as you do. And we have been sacrificing to him ever since the days of Eshardon, uh, king of uh, Assyria, who brought us here. Okay, so that's a reference back to 2 Kings 17. Uh, we've been worshiping Yahweh. We've been worshiping this Jehovah God. And let us help you. We'll, we'll build the temple with you. Uh, verse 3, but Zerubbabel, Jeshua, uh, some might say Joshua, and the rest of the heads of the fathers' houses in Israel said to them, You have nothing to do uh, with us in building a house to our God, but we will build to the Lord, the God of Israel, uh, alone, as King, as king Cyrus, the king of the Persians, has commanded us. And so they rejected them. They didn't view them as, as worthy to join in with them and build uh, the sacred space uh, for, for God to dwell. So uh, that's a little bit of the history we get in the Old Testament. Um, but it carries over that, that animosity, that the, the view of them as a foreigner, as an outsider, as different. Um, 
it, it carries over into the New Testament. Uh, we see this also with Jesus at the uh, well talking to the Samaritan woman. Uh, she even reflects that in what she says in John 4 where she says, we know that you, you Jews don't have dealings with us who are uh, Samaritans. And so there was quite a divide. Uh, I would imagine that most um, Israelites, uh, most uh, Jews, would view the uh, Samaritans as their enemy. All right, so here Jesus is bringing that up. That he was a Samaritan. Why do you think he brought that up? So the view of the Jewish people of the Samaritans were they were they were irreligious, right? They were apostate. Like the parable of the, of the, uh, the good, good Samaritan, right? Yes, the good Samaritan. Kind of an oxymoron to the Jew. Right, it would be an oxymoron to the Jew, the good Samaritan. While the, the Levite, who would work in the temple, and the priest, who would go before God on behalf of the people, would even help this guy. That was uh, yeah, nearly dead. Yeah, I'm sure he raised more than just eyebrows. Mm -hmm. and, and probably he did it exactly for that purpose. Could this Samaritan have been an Israelite? He would have been a descendant of the Israelites. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, but he would have mixed with the nations. Yeah, yeah maybe he mixed with other nations. Right. Yeah, and so, and we even see that in. Um, in, in the next, uh, for, let's, let's just read it, uh, verses 17 and 18. And then Jesus answered, Were not the ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? So Jesus is even bringing up his race and saying, Is it, is it only this one that returns? Um, by the way, what book is the Good Samaritan in? What gospel? You know? It's in Luke, right? Yeah. Luke and this one's in Luke. Interesting. When we think about Luke, the physician, um, many people associate his gospel with te teaching the who? The Jews? And the Gentiles. Oh, the Gentiles, okay. Theophilus. And so, yeah, Theophilus, which Theophilus is a very Greek name. It means... Uh, Friend of God, right? Um, philos. Well, would it, no, it would be lover of God, philos. Yeah. So, um, it's almost like Luke is crafting these stories, or at least revealing these stories that would be, be very meaningful to the original audience, and saying, hey, Samaritans, they can be godly, too. They can be saved, too. Um, and so, uh, it's a shame that we have to say that in our world, that all races can be saved. But because of the hardness of our hearts, sometimes we don't readily acknowledge it, or at least we carry some animosity towards other people. Or we should view them as potential brothers and sisters in Christ. All right, so he highlights here that he is a Samaritan, the enemy of the Jews, someone that would have been looked on uh, negatively as well. But also I think not only highlighting him as a Samaritan shows the goodness of the Samaritan, but what does it do to the Jews? He has this phrase, was, was the only one that came back a Samaritan? I think it makes them look bad. Okay, it makes them look bad? Okay, it makes the Jews look bad? Okay, so maybe portraying the, the Jewish people as not as grateful. Now, did the Jewish people have anything to be grateful for? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, if there's any people that should be grateful to God for what God had done, he had chosen them out of all the nations of the world in which to bring the Savior of the world. He had done so many things in the past. I mean, just read the Old Testament brought them out of slavery. He gave them, a, gave them a land flowing with milk and honey. He was with them and, and blessed them when they were faithful to him. 
uh, out of all people, uh, the Jewish people should be grateful. But they seem, in this case, that was not, was not the case. So um, I think that's a little bit of a warning to us uh, who have been blessed by God in our life to uh, make sure that we're not taking God for granted. Because evidently it's easy for us sometimes to do. So here he highlights this one Samaritan, this one foreigner that came back and praised and thanked him. Then verse 19 says, He said to him, Rise, go in your way. Your faith has made you well. All right, so when we think about the first ten, you know, when they first left, Weren't they all made well? Yes. Okay. And uh, was faith required to make them well? Mm -hmm. they, were, they showed a faithfulness. They showed a reverence. They called him master. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I guess you could say they were rewarded for their faith. Uh, so an initial faith. But the, don't you get a sense reading this towards the end that that Jesus is extending something more than just physical healing? It, it is interesting that uh, this is kind of an offshoot of your question there. That when they when they asked, they didn't say Jesus, Master, heal us. They just said, "Have mercy." And there is a sense where a lot of the people at that time associated their illnesses with their sinfulness, right? Yeah. And so there, there is... Why was this man more blind than his fault? Right, so even the disciples were believing that uh, at that time. So uh, may, maybe there is some correlation there. There's also a correlation between uh, awareness That, that is a thing to think about. Where are they? Where are the other nine? If you were someone who had been isolated from a life that you knew for, I don't know how long, months, years, what would you be doing if you now had an ability to be free from that? Evidently, that this one knew who Jesus was, and evidently these others did too, but they just didn't come back. Okay, so, so there's a difference between acknowledging who Jesus is and what he can do, and there's, it seems like it's a, a higher level of faith that gives that gratitude. Notice here that Jesus says that. He says, your faith has made you well. Okay? Um, and so he is commending his faith, and he's correlating that to his gratitude. So if we're going to have faith, what do we need? Action. 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 Well, action and thankfulness. And thankfulness, yes, yes. If we, are, if we are someone who truly believes what God has done, uh, we should be people who thank him for that. Sometimes we wonder, <clears throat> what does it take uh, for us to feel the need to speak to someone about the spiritual matters? Faith. To walk up to someone and say, how's your faith? And I think a lot of things like that enter into gratitude of where you've been. And, you know, you, I'm sure you've seen it, the person who's been the lowest is often the most grateful when they mm -hmm. find Christ. Right. And uh, oftentimes, you know, subsequently, the most thankful. Right. Uh, and you know, I was uh, raised churchy, you know, if you want to call it that. And, and sometimes I have to remind myself you know, the greatest blessing in life is uh, salvation. And I, it, it's easy, sometimes it's easy for me to forget. Right. 
Well, it's it makes somebody aware of the the import of your salvation. It, it seems like it's a, a good parallel to what Jesus said um, when the woman of the city came and washed his feet. You know, he who uh, is forgiven little loves little, and then he shows with her. She hasn't stopped. You know, crying, washing her, washing my feet, and kissing my feet. Um, yeah, the people who acknowledge what God has done for them, that acknowledge their sinfulness and how much God has to forgive them, I think there is a level of gratitude that's expressed in our words, our actions, and how we live our lives. It's, uh, we all have to work through where we came from. You know, we all started at different points, some further away from God, some closer to God. But uh, we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And uh, because of what God has done for us in Jesus by forgiving us of our sins and saving us from the wrath to come, I mean, there's just no doubt that we are all, um, we all should be obliged to thank him for what he does for us. Um, one thing I want to point out to it in verse 19 is this word well. And I really, does anyone have any other translations of that word well in verse 19? Because your faith has made you well. Any other translations? Made thee whole. Whole? Okay. The Amplified says you're relieved. You're, you're relieved? Believed. Oh, belief. Your, your belief, belief has what? Has restored you to health. Restored you to your health. Health. Your, your health. health. Okay. Okay. Um, I think that translating it well, uh, you know, your faith has made you well. I think that's a poor translation. Uh, mine actually has a footnote here. Maybe yours does too, where it says, "Or has saved you." You saw that one. On yours too. Yeah, this is also true. Refers back from that saved to healed you. Mm -hmm. Made you whole. Yeah, yeah. Um, the word literally in the Greek is sozo. Um, I actually heard recently that there's a a um, a drug rehab that is called sozo, which means salvation or I save. And so to me, it makes sense that yes. That initial faith for the, the first ten, it made them physically well. But what Jesus is talking about is not about his physical wellness. We can see that by the context, right? He's already physically well. But he's saying, rise, go in your way. Your, your faith has saved you. You've had your sins washed away. Because you have been grateful. You have praised and acknowledged what God has done for you. And so I would say that saving faith is something that requires us to be grateful, to be thankful for what God has done for us. So those are some th things to think about in this passage. And so I want to transition here. We've got about uh, 10 minutes left. And think about how we can be like this Samaritan leper and how we can go back to Jesus and thank him. What do you think? Well, if we were in his shoes, it would be obvious. We could go right back to him and, and bow down before him and praise him. But in our day and time, how do we make sure that we are following his example, that we have faith that will lead to salvation? Okay, so uh, maybe doing the will of the Father, spreading his word to other people is a way to say thank you. Okay, what else? I think you, I mean, it's not all of that. Help me heaven. Okay.
Okay, so by our generosity, our thoughtfulness, we can say thank you to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Teaching your children. Okay, so teaching your children. Okay. I can see that. Yeah, he's calling him to a, that higher righteousness. That it's not just about the ceremony, but it's it's also about having gratitude in your heart towards God. You know, and Jesus, uh, you know, repeats some of that. You know, I desire mercy over sacrifice. I desire uh, uh, kindness, a loving kindness over sacrifice. Uh, kind of a a reflection of Hosea six six. And so, uh, yeah, God didn't want them just to obey the rules um, it's not about obeying the rules it's about submitting yourself to the rule maker and showing how truly grateful you are for, for the goodness that comes uh, through him yes So that acknowledgement of sin, that confession of sin, uh, reminds us how dependent we are on him. Um, I've got several different things. One would be prayer that, that I kind of linked in uh, the New Testament to uh, Thanksgiving that we can do. And I, I think the last one will kind of be inclusive of some of the other things that you said, like teaching children and being generous and, and um, sharing the gospel. Let me read a few for you, okay? Colossians 4 and verse 2, this is, goes along with what Bethany was saying. Con continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. The prayer is done with thanksgiving. Then, uh, just a little bit before that, Colossians 3, verses 15 and 16 the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in uh, wisdom, song, singing psalms, hymns, and 
spiritual songs and, uh, with thankfulness in your heart to God. When we sing, we're saying, God, we thank you. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 28-29. Let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. When we worship God, uh, we are to be thankful for what he's given us here, uh, that he's given us a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And the last one I have here is Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. And this is all encompassing. Uh, Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Abide in him and do it with thanksgiving. I think those are coupled together uh, because... It's a part of our whole lives. Our whole lives should be a, a thank you note to the Lord to tell him all that we are grateful for what he has done uh, for him. And so I encourage you, as you go about your week, have a spirit of gratitude. Thanksgiving isn't just for the month of November. Uh, for a Christian who has been saved uh, through faith, it is a part of our daily life, just like this leper did. So let me encourage you to do that. Uh, as you go about your week and be grateful for all that God has done for you. Uh, we'll see you next week.